All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to a special Prog Report podcast. Uh, we're very happy to welcome our good friend, Mike Portnoy, back to the show, back to the program. Hey, hello. Hey, hey man. Uh, welcome to 2023. And joining us again is Jeff and Nick. And uh, I think this is the same group that did this um, episode last year where we did the top uh, 50 albums, sorry, top albums turning 50 in uh, 2022. And um, we're doing an even better year, I think, this this time around, 1973, which was, I mean, a pretty incredible year. All the great albums that we all still listen to, it's pretty insane. You know, I wonder how many albums that come out this year we'd be listening to 50 years from now, you know, like. You, I'm sure you can count them on one hand, probably. <laughs> right. Yeah. I will be dead, so. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself, Jim. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, uh, or if the, the new uh, if the new Harry Styles album will be considered, uh, you know, like Dark Side of the Moon or something. Who knows? Well, I know but, there's one that that's coming out this year that hopefully will still be listened to 50 years from now. That's right. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll talk about that for sure. Seamless. <laughs> Uh, a couple 50, of things, uh, uh, some housekeeping here because we do have uh, some stuff that you're involved with coming, coming through, Mike. Um, but I, I want to just ask you about the uh, Metal Hall of Fame that you were just at with uh, playing with your old friend's Twisted Sister and, and what that was like. And I guess they weren't supposed to play anymore because they had retired and, and I guess they did this one more show. Is that officially the end and, and that's it? Uh, who knows? I, I think, you know, the, the thing... Uh... Uh, the farewell tour in 2016 was about, you know, no more touring, but I think they've always said they would be up for, you know, one-offs for a special occasion if the right, uh, you know, situation presented itself. So I think that's exactly what happened. You know, they were uh, uh, called uh, called to be uh, inducted into that metal hall of fame. And I guess uh, it was a good excuse to be able to play together again. So uh, I'm glad I could do it. It was, it was awesome. We played three songs and uh, it was just so much fun seeing the guys and, and playing together again after all these years. Uh, Mike, we've we, we got to ask you a couple of general questions about the winery dog. I mean, this is the year of the dog. The triple threat is back, 2023. Uh, the winery dog's three. Uh, February the 3rd, 2023 is the release date, and it's under three dog music. So um, it'll be out by the time this airs, I would presume. Uh, Mike, you've got to be thrilled with the response that it's had so far. You want to tell us a little bit about it? Uh, uh, what was it like making the album? How, uh, did you predict that it would be received this well? Um, it's great to be working together again. It's been seven years or or one dog year, for that matter, <laughs> <laughs> since the last album. And um, yeah, you know, it's it's a great, great band. You know, I love working with Billy and Richie and, you know, it's always about the songs. And I think this album is chock full of great songs. You know, I think it's one of those strong albums from top to bottom, 10 songs, all killer, no filler. Um, so far, the reception for Xanadu and Mad World, the first two singles have, have been great. It's just one of those bands. I mean, you know, obviously we're here on the prog report, so it's a very prog oriented audience. Uh, but, you know, with, with all the things I do, you know, I, usually they're rooted in either prog or metal but the winery dogs is really not either of those and it seems that everybody loves the winery dogs it seems like there's a little bit of something for everybody in this band you know it, it's got the hooks and you know the focus of strong songs and concise songwriting you know all the songs are like in the four or five minute zone but yet it has uh you know the the three of us sprinkling, uh, you know, the way we play our instruments on on top of it all. So it keeps it interesting at all times and couldn't be more excited to uh, spend the year with, with these two guys out in the road. And speaking of the road, uh, you guys are going out on the 15th. Um, can you give us a couple of hints about what the fans can expect? It's a three ring circus. You know, when you see the winery dogs, it's like no matter which one of us you're watching or listening to, you're going to be entertained and I love playing live with this band. It's definitely all about the live energy with this band. You know, the power trio cranked up to 11, just rocking. It's like old school Cream or Hendrix or Zeppelin. It's just got that vibe. And uh, I just love playing live with these guys. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to pretty much stay focused on the winery dogs all year. All three of us are pretty much committed and focused on on the winery dogs without 
uh, much other activity elsewhere with any of our other bands or projects. So uh, nice. it's going to be a very full year. Uh, the calendar's already full, and that's pretty much only half of the dates to come. So there's a lot more to come as well. Nice. Cool. And of course, a, a carryover from from last year, or indeed arguably from from the year 2000, I suppose, ultimately is the transatlantic Um the kind of the, the culmination of the the absolute universe work in terms of the the live album that's coming out um it probably all seems like quite a long time ago but do you yeah. have any any memories of that particular show that's coming out the the final show in in Paris on the tour right well transatlantic will actually have two releases this year the first one will be february uh what is it 17th i think is the 17th. the yeah. live uh in paris box set which is the very very last show of the tour uh and then later in the year we'll be releasing the 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 morse fest weekend uh which is a, which will be another big release but yeah talking specifically about the paris show i mean it was it was so emotional you know as as be, has been discussed and talked about uh elsewhere you know it's very possible that could be the very final transatlantic show uh time will tell we don't know uh but if indeed it ends up being the very final show we ever played, it, it, we couldn't have asked for a a better send off and a better, you know, end to the to the that chapter. Whether or not that ends up being the final chapter, you know, we don't know. But it was just so emotional. You could see it in between every song, the standing ovations and the feeling in the room. And, you know, at the end of the show, the, the standing ovation went for, you know, a good five minutes or so at the end of the night. Neil was broken down crying well neil's always crying <laughs> but in this particular <laughs> night show. this particular <laughs> night there were a, an extra amount of tears and uh yeah it was really a very very special evening also i have the uh i just got this i mean you can see it here the lockdown uh morris fest thing um you got yours and uh that's also an amazing uh, wait jeff's was signed i guess jeff was one of the first yes 100 pre-order well you were somebody, on your pre somebody scribbled right. over the, i don't know what it says but <laughs> At least he signed above himself and not me. Usually signs right over me. <laughs> but that this one's cool because it has the Thoughts trilogy and and the Great Nothing and the Solo Gratia and and the cover to cover thing you guys did. So that was um, that we all watched from home on our computers. It was uh, oh, that was a wild time. I'll tell um, you what. I mean, that was one of my favorite Morse Fests of them all because uh, I always wanted to do a cover to cover night. So. Uh, you know, getting to finally do a cover show. Well, it was a, a weird Morse Fest, as you yeah. guys know, because we were in lockdown and we had maybe 30 people in the audience, whatever. So it was very, very, uh, very bizarre, but it was really fulfilling. The cover show was one of my favorite Morse Fests ever. And the portion of the show where we all got to switch instruments was so much fun. So, yeah, anybody, anybody that hasn't ordered that, get it, because it's definitely a, a must have for your, your Morse Fest collection. Right. I think. I think the other thing about it is when you actually look at the set list and go, there's maybe, I think we worked out there's maybe only two or three songs on this that actually you'd ever played live before. Yeah, you know, that's true. Like, I mean, it's like, you know, 99% of it is, st is stuff that, you know, Had never, never played. ever played live, you know, that's and good. a lot of it possibly may not again. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> that's right. One and only. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. Well, cool, man. So congrats on everything going on. It's going to be a busy year. A lot of great music, um, as always. Very cool. And uh, But we're going to talk about some of the greatest albums ever made. Uh, we have 16 albums. We're just going to throw up some of them and, and just talk and, and talk about why we like them and, and what's great about them, whatever. Nick, uh, let's get you uh, to kick this off. Okay. All right. Well, uh, everybody knows that I'm a big Jethro Tull fan. Um, and Thick as a Brick really cemented that for me in, in 72. But uh, Jethro Tull's sixth album, A Passion Play, took me much more time to get into. Um, look, there was a lot of great music in 73. Um, it was it was kind of that year when all the prog bands had, had established themselves, entrenched themselves. And in 73, I, I, I kind of get the feeling they were all kind of saying, what? What next? You know, we've we've outdone ourselves. What what is next for us? And many of these bands re released albums number six or seven, 
um, which was kind of indicative of them being far more experimental. You know, bands like like I don't want to take anybody else's uh, uh, thunder here, but but a lot of bands started to get very experimental, and uh, and and Jethro Tull, while while they continued um, the the proggy trends of Thick as a Brick, uh, in my opinion, went far deeper into their own psyche, particularly Ian Anderson's when, when they wrote a passion play. It was a very troubled album to make. Um, there were all kinds of shenanigans going on when they tried to record it in France to begin with at the famous Chateau de Héroville studio, which, which Ian Anderson dubbed as Chateau Disaster, because they, they literally had to come back to Britain and start all over again. So it, it was kind of troubled. And I, and I think you can hear that in the production, particularly. It's a little bit rushed, a little bit just disjointed in, in places. It's not quite as slick, as thick as a brick. But once you get into it, and once you give it a chance after repeated listens, it definitely does uh, uh, release its potential. It's a story about uh, this this pilgrim uh, fellow who dies and goes to his own funeral and then his views of the afterlife and all that. It's a pretty deep stuff, um, but uh, it certainly take, takes a lot of getting used to. I, I would say it's Jethro Tull's most con conceptual and probably their most proggy release. And I would say to fans out there who who didn't give it a chance in 73 or subsequently, stick with it, get, give it another go, especially one of the remasters, perhaps Stephen Wilson's remaster. Um, uh, he did one in 2014. Go through it, get over the fable bit, the spoken word bit, um, which which takes some, some getting over, I must say. But eventually you will love this album. It's got a whole heap under the hood. Give it a go. Jethro Tull's A Passion Play. Yeah, very well. And, and of course, uh, Tall has a new album that was just announced, uh, Rock Flute, which comes out on April 21st and, uh, and a single out now. So you can check that out. Good way I to kick it off. Laid, you've laid down that challenge, Dominic. I, I have always yeah. struggled with it out of all of yeah. them. I, I just, I find it hard to navigate that particular album, but I'll give it another go, seeing as you <laughs> asked nicely. <laughs> I did. I did. I always uh, say please, Jeff. All right, Jeff, uh, why don't you go next? Well, talking of um, difficult albums, and I think this is a difficult sixth album, if uh, if 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 my maths I've just done on my head is correct. Um, and another one that probably got pretty much mauled by the press, I think, whenever it came out, and but probably has become quite synonymous, uh, Tales from Topographic Oceans by Yes!, um, and again, I mean, just back to what Nick said, you know, what, you know, bands who'd done lots of albums trying to think, how can I push this further? How can I be more experimental? Yes, had done close to the edge with a, a one side long track. So they decided to do an album with four side long tracks. Um, and I guess, yeah, you know, it's been called many, many things. Um, it, it is more difficult to navigate i think as an album than than most of the other yes albums in the catalog and probably like these types of albums there are people who absolutely love it as their very very best thing and there are people who absolutely hate it as their very worst thing i think for me it's probably a bit of a mixture of both um i i hate the the notion of you know if only it was shorter if only it you know had skipped some bits but look it is what it is it's there to listen to it's quite an accomplishment and the one thing that i would say about it for anybody who has struggled with it um back to stephen wilson again the, there was a, a a remix that was put out again probably i don't know five six years ago it has a, a on the blu-ray of it it has a fully instrumental version of the album and again, I'll, I'll probably get shot down by Yes fans for saying that. But if you take out the vocals from the album, there's an awful lot going on there that um, is probably you don't notice until you kind of don't don't have the vocals to kind of distract you from it. That's a terrible thing to say, I know. Mm. Um, but musically, there's a lot of really, really interesting stuff. And, and the other thing that, that that particular version does is it really brings to the fore what Alan White was doing. Because I think... 
the album can sound a little bit mushy sometimes and obviously it was his first album with the band and he really has some incredible incredible moments in that album um and probably doesn't get credit for that can i jump in for a minute yeah go for it uh touching upon what you just mentioned about instrumental versions and and the uh you know without the vocals as you guys know, uh, Transatlantic, we played side one of Topographic with John Anderson yeah. on Progressive Nation at Sea. But, uh, you know, the weeks leading up to that, the we as a band were rehearsing it instrumentally without uh, John's vocals. Yeah. And it was so difficult for me to wrap my head around that arrangement uh, instrumentally, because it would be like, OK, we'll do this riff 17 times and then we're going <laughs> to do this thing three times with a crescendo and then crash five times. It made like no, no sense. It was like one of the most difficult things I have had ever had to learn. And then once we rehearsed it with John and with vocals, suddenly it made sense because he was kind of conducting through it yeah. and he was kind of the anchor. So it's interesting that you point out listening to it without this, without the right. quote unquote distraction of the vocals. But to me, <laughs> it, it didn't make sense until we performed it with the vocals. Yeah, well, I've seen some YouTube clips of that, and he is very much kind of doing that piece. But I think I think the thing about it it is that it there, there's an awful lot going on musically. I suppose you know Rick is famously uh, negative about the album, but actually when you strip it back, there's a lot of good stuff that he's doing. There's a lot of parts of it which are difficult to get through, but um, you know. It is what it is. I saw them playing in the London Palladium at the Yes 50 so shows and they did one of the tracks and it was spectacular. Um, the guy beside me fell asleep during it, but <laughs> <laughs> he tra he told me he traveled from Paris to, to, to London to see Yes in the London Palladium and he fell asleep uh, <laughs> during ritual. So uh, there you go. Well, sleeping or not, what would the world be without topographic oceans, right? It wouldn't be the yeah. world. Yeah, yeah indeed. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of the proggiest of prog albums yeah, that that was ever made. Uh, all right, so uh, I'll go next. Um, mine sort of is a twofer because this band released back in the days when bands released two albums a year, which is I, unthinkable now. I can't even imagine that. But um, ELO Electric Light Orchestra released ELO two and on the third day in in seventy three. Um, Jeff and I have sort of disagreed on this a little bit. He he's he prefers on the third day, but I, I actually like ELO 2 a lot because I think really that's the proggiest album they ever made. Um, it has it's only five songs. It has their longest song on it, uh, Kiyama, which I think is really cool. I mean, the production is not great by any stretch compared to what eventually would would become sort of a signature thing with the the Jeff Lynne sound on on later albums. But musically, it's really adventurous. Um, it also does have Rollover Beethoven, which was a, a hit for them off that album. And um, and Roy Wood had just left the band during the recording. So Jeff was starting to take over. And they were really a prog band during this period. I mean, not trying to write hit songs or anything. Of course, on the third day is the one that has uh, Mama Bell, which they still played live occasionally. And then they recorded Showdown, which I guess wasn't actually on the album initially, but but was a single um i think now if you buy it though i think it's on there um they, it was added but um yeah so two great albums by one of my favorite bands and and uh if you wanted to see elo being a bit more adventurous and proggy elo too is definitely uh, a good listen at least i think i don't know yeah i just love the the opening um what is it the king is our king of the universe i love that uh, i think yeah. the chat will track it on the third day yeah it's brilliant yeah, yeah, good favorites. stuff. Uh, all right, Mike, what's your first one? Well, uh, Nick mentioned uh, Jethro Tull and Thick as a Brick earlier, and Thick as a Brick, which came out '72, was the first time I had ever heard of a uh, uh, a double sided album of one song. You know, obviously, Yes had done Close to the Edge, and Genesis did Supper's Ready. Uh, bands were doing the side long thing, but Toll did a double out, you know, double sided album of one song. The next one that did that uh, came out in 73. And this is an all-time favorite album of mine. This is Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells. Yeah. 
And uh, most people out there probably know this as the theme for The Exorcist. You know, this at the time, I think they put out like a five minute edit of just the the, the main themes from side one, which was used in The Exorcist. But this whole album is incredible. And Mike Oldfield plays every instrument on here. It's it's both sides is one song. It's just one track, Tubular Bells on both sides. And um, I, I, I don't know if anybody else had been making albums that back then of playing every instrument but uh it's it's really an incredible feat and then there's the whole second half of side one where he goes through uh the same theme being played on all these different instruments and he'll bring in the grand piano and the glockenspiel and the uh the you know double speed electric guitar and it, it was really um an incredible uh production the fact that you could layer all of these instruments all played by him and hear the way that a song and an album and the instrumentation is built, but it's really tremendous. And then through the years, Mike Oldfield has put out all different new versions, you know, re-recording, reissues, new, you know, versions, symphonic, blah, blah, blah. But I don't think anything beats the original. The original is just such a classic. And there's a great video on YouTube of him playing this with a band back then, in I guess around 73 or so. And they're all hippies and they, you, you could just smell the pot smoke and the, <laughs> you know, the, the patchouli oil. And uh, I could just imagine. But yeah, what a what an amazing album and a great, great listen. If you don't know it, it's a must listen to one of my favorites, Mike Oldfield, Tubular Bells. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm delighted. I'm quite surprised that again, that maybe I just don't expect that that would be an album on your radar, but I guess with the movie connection as well, I should have put that uh, I, together. And... I was listening to this in 73, honest to God. I mean, my dad at the yeah, time yeah. was a, uh, a disc jockey on the radio. And uh, I remember he utilized tubular bells for one of the, uh, the commercials he had to do on the air. And I literally was a fan when this came out back in 73, wow, I was brilliant. listening to it back then. Wow. Cool. Uh, I mean, it's an I, album. I, I, I never I, saw I the love... movie at all. You never uh, seen The Exorcist? I have. I never heard. saw The Exorcist. No, oh, just I mean, I've, I've still seen, never seen the movie. I've seen the scenes. You know, the famous scenes. Of the, that I, I'm a scary cat, in. man. I'm. I'm a. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> that's pretty scary, and I think a lot <laughs> of people like uh, they had. You know, people that were traumatized by The Exorcist probably can't listen to this album because it would bring back like you know postpartum. Uh, <laughs> that, that's the point, right? I, yeah. I, I don't want PTSD that movie to spoil whatever. this great, great, spoil the great album. You know? yeah. yeah, I guess basically invented Prague. That's cool. It's a. I can't. I can't counted up just before and i think i've got 14 different recordings and that doesn't count tubular bells 2 and tubular bells 3 but there's a whole kind of cult of uh people who have made there were two versions last year that were put out because of the uh sort of the proximity to the anniversary um right. and i think i think the brilliant thing about it is that as well as it being the um you know the album was all him that actually people then have tried to kind of do it in all sorts of different you know different ways and do it live and do it stuff stuff like that um but there's just so many moments the thing that i discovered reading up actually the other day was that it it was it wasn't called tubular bells until the bit where viv stanchel announces the instruments was done he it was called opus one Hmm. And whenever that was recorded, they went and at the end. He goes, "Oh, plus tubular bells." He went, "Oh, that th there's the title for it." There, <laughs> I like the tubular bells are only like on the last, you yeah. know, probably two minutes of the album. But yeah, yeah, yeah. iconic. Well, great, and it made it to the cover. All right, Nick, uh, what's your second one? Okay, well, I'm 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 so glad Mike picked that one um, because you know. <laughs> There, there are some there are some bands who pretend to incorporate classical influences into their music, but really they don't have the chops when the rubber hits the road. But certainly not this band, certainly not these guys. Emerson Lake and Palmer, who released Brain Salad Surgery, uh, their fourth studio album, um, and it was released late in '73. I think it was November or December, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and they had just, of course, formed their, their record label, Manticore Records. And this was the first release on Manticore. Now, for me, Trilogy was always going to be hard, if not impossible, to beat. And I'm not sure Brain Salad Surgery does beat it, but it certainly is an album that made its mark. 
not only uh, with with the production of of Greg Lake, but uh, that that crazy bizarre H.R. Geiger uh, fold out cover, uh, which has become literally uh, or, or, almost a, a landmark in in music generally, not just in Prague. Um, and this is certainly an album that gets better with time. Uh, it was very successful. It made it to number two, I think, in the UK. I think it was top ten in in the US. And it led to that bombastic cannon bearing tour, you know, that that everybody speaks about, that that very opulent over the top tour. Um, there have been many, many masters, remixes, remasters, but in particular, I like the 5.1 surround remix uh, that that uh, Jaco Jaksik uh, did. Um, uh, there are other remixes, it doesn't have to be that one. Um, but it, it, it certainly has aged well. And it still sounds great to this day, even if you're listening to the to the original 1973 vinyl version. Um, there have been various covers done of, of, of most of the tracks on it, including Khan Evil 9. Uh, I suppose in plural, you, you'd call them Khan Evil or Khan's Evil 9, I suppose, that, that are out there. Lots of people have, have tried to do it, but there's nothing quite like ELP's version. Um, Interestingly, the album also includes Keith Emerson's only vocal credit. And of course, it has, as Mike will acknowledge, a, a percussion movement on it, which is fancy terminology for a drum solo. Mm. And of course, Carl Palmer at his best. Um, it's got to, uh, a, a classical uh, a composition, Toccata by Ginastera. It's got a version of Jerusalem. Um, and it's the first time, interestingly, that a polyphonic Moog synthesizer was recorded. Uh, it was called the Moog Apollo. Um, mm. It was produced by the band. Um, it's got a it's got a few weird connotations. I'm not sure if you guys know what brain salad surgery actually means, but it's uh, it's got a bit of an off the wall connotation, uh, which came from a Dr. John song originally. Like it, love it, hate it. This is part of prog history, and it's got to be on this list. Brain salad surgery. Yeah. yeah, that's one thing about this collection of albums too is the co the, the covers are all like iconic. I mean. This one is something you still see everywhere now, and it and it's not even the most famous one we're going to talk about, which is going to be obvious to anybody. But um, yes, the covers are are incredible. Well, you do know that part of the cover was airbrushed up by the band because uh, I don't remember it, if I heard it, that. <laughs> it 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 was a phallus. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's what I was talking about earlier, yeah. and uh, so the. The band and the label and brushed that out but that was hr geiger's original vision yeah yeah yeah, yeah. uh all right jeff okay um next one on my list uh the debut album by queen um really important because it introduced the band uh to the world um i mean i don't i doubt there's any queen fan that i've met who says it's their greatest album but in terms of presenting all of the things that they would build and grow and develop over the course of the years, it's pretty much all there. That guitar sound, Freddie's voice, the harmonies, Keep Yourself Alive kicks it off, you know, a rock song, but it's quite accessible. It's poppy, almost sing along. All three, Brian, Roger uh, and Freddie all sing at different solo parts of it um so i sort of see it as a bit of, a bit of a roadmap to 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 what to what lies ahead again brian roger freddie all right on it i don't think john had started um to write yet and the the history of it is an album that they kind of made on borrowed studio time by coming in at the early hours of the morning and working through to um sorry late at night and working through to early hours of the morning um, it then sat around for about a year until the label released it, by which time they had kind of moved on and were, were on to other things. But um, just, yeah, all of the key elements that we know as Queen were there and the, the very, very different and very distinct. Um, and, you know, a, sort of songs like Liar, um, which is really their heavier end of things, but then something very... You know, my fairy king, which is a very kind of Freddy, uh, you know, kind of camp uh, epic, um, and you know, the 
know the the lovely little closing minute or so of the start of Seven Seas Awry, which kind of looks ahead to the next album and everything that's to come. I think that's a a sort of nice, clever little way to end. Um, so yeah, the first Queen album. Yeah, I think you you put it right. It's an important record. It's not one I rarely go back to. You know, um, Keep Yourself Alive is still great. Liar's great. Um, not much of it I care for too much, but um, but yeah, I mean it's still a solid debut by by them. I'll never forget the first time that I heard Liar when Roger comes in with that full Liar. That it, that is a moment that I will never forget. So powerful amazing amazing band amazing album yeah but you know what talking about those queen stacked harmonies especially roger taylor's voice i don't think it's uh acknowledged enough how much i think they got that sound from sweet if you listen to the early sweet albums those high roger taylor vocals they were doing that first and and you could tell that queen kind of copped the riffs of sabbath with the vocals of sweet and uh, if you go back to those early sweet albums you'll hear predated queen harmonies yeah it's not a bad comparison yeah, yeah. For, for sure interesting um so uh quite a few of the albums we're talking about are are not really you know quote unquote prog they're more uh just classic rock but but they they fit in in with the albums we like because i think a lot of classic rock back then was uh adventurous and still sort of figuring out what were the rules and what you could do and and uh not not living by certain exact formats and stuff and a perfect example of that is the one i'll talk about now which is uh paul mccartney and wings uh band on the run which um yeah i mean just an incredible record and uh i guess the third wings album the fifth since he had left the beatles um obviously features the the uh, all-time classic title track i mean the whole album is is a hit basically <laughs> it's you know n officially i mean i guess the hits were banned on the run and jet um but uh, he's played a lot of these songs live and and they're all very known i mean let me roll it is is just a huge song that's been in the life set forever uh mrs vanderbilt is a great fun track uh 1985 is a great um bluebirds all i mean the whole album is just awesome and uh has that iconic cover again another one we talked about with uh, that's just so memorable um and a cool story behind it too they tried to record the album in nigeria and then they got held up at gunpoint and had their tape stolen and and all that kind of stuff nigeria? which makes it really, really cool yeah yeah i didn't know that yeah i guess there was an emi wow. studio there and they wanted to record it somewhere unique and and uh and so they were held up at gunpoint <laughs> i mean it's crazy stuff but uh still managed to produce uh you know arguably his best album post beatles i mean you know for for many it, it is and and uh and i think is it true i think john lennon was this he said this was a good album or something right he, he like he because he had mocked i can't him. picture that <laughs> I, I thought I read that. Lennon had just mocked. Ram, no, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah, before that, he had mocked the other album. stuff. But that's maybe he had liked this one. I don't know if that's true. But um, but yeah, I mean, what else can you say about this record? I still love it. I still listen to it. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll, I'll take the the handoff because uh, 1973, uh, all four Beatles had solo albums in '73. Mm. Uh, it's a handful here. Luckily, it's yeah. the CDs and not the vinyls. Yeah. Uh, Mind Games, Living in the Material World, Ringo's Ringo album and Band on the Run. And surprisingly, in my opinion, I mean, I think Band on the Run was the best of the four. But surprisingly, I think the second best of the four was Ringo's album. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not this isn't my official entry. I'm just right, kind right, of uh, yeah. <laughs> commenting on, on your uh, band on the run pick yeah. but this Ringo album uh I think it's the only Beatles solo album that all four Beatles appear on uh yeah. and all all uh other three Beatles contributed uh songs they wrote songs for this album uh John Paul and George all wrote songs for this album and on the song I am the greatest which John wrote uh Ringo John and George all appear on that song and then oh, wow. Paul Paul wrote uh, the song Six O'Clock, not the Dream Theater song, and Paul plays on that as well. So yeah, this is, I think, the only post-Beatles album that all four Beatles appear on, and I, in my opinion, 
that's a, it's a stronger album than either John's or uh, George's releases that year. So anyway, but that's not one of my official picks. That's just a footnote to yours. Yeah, let's dive into it. It's a great, uh, my, it's a great album. Can't disagree. My next pick is, uh, this was my gateway entry to Frank Zappa's music, Overnight Sensation. Oh. And uh, I mean, the, the albums that preceded this, I loved uh, Whirling In It For The Money. I loved uh hot rats but it wasn't until overnight sensation that i really started to latch on to what what zappa was doing and this was kind of he started to venture more into the more fusion-esque stuff i mean he's got george duke on this and uh john luke ponte uh ruth and ian underwood which is incredible then the fowler brothers the horns and then uh ralph humphrey on drums but this if you don't no Zappa and the world of Zappa is a huge undertaking. I mean, really, yeah, it is. It, it, this, the discography is huge, and a lot of people don't know where to start. This is a great starting point. It's only seven songs, and every one of these are a, a classic Camarillo Brillo, I Am the Slime, Dirty Love, 50 50, Zombie Wolf, Dynamo Hum, and Montana. Those are seven Montana. classic essential yeah. Zappa songs. And from here, he went to make uh, Apostrophe, which is equally as, as great as this one. Uh, and also the Roxy and Elsewhere album. And then he started to work with Terry Bozio and so on and so forth. My favorite Zappa stuff is the stuff in the 70s. But this is the, a great entry point if you don't know your Zappa discography. Overnight Sensation, classic, classic album. A cool. fun, funny story. I can nice. tell you. I can tell you exactly where I was when I first heard Montana. Which was, Were you in Montana? Montana. <laughs> no, <laughs> I was in Victoria Park in London at the High Voltage Festival watching uh, Dweezil's Zappa play Zappa. Oh, Bam. I was on the side of stage of that. Stage right. Yeah. <laughs> and, was and, you and, I, you and I were both at that concert and we hadn't met yet, Jeff. Really? That's correct. That's, That's amazing. Correct. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I remember you. watching that show from the side of the stage. Well, Zappa play Zappa had toured with uh, Dream Theater the year prior, which was for me, one of the coolest experiences as a. Did you Zappa play with them on that show? Did you play? I was something? sitting. No, I didn't sit in with them at High Voltage, but oh, I no. sat in with them many no, times no, no. throughout uh, when they were touring with us. Yeah. yeah. Mike, you told me to shut up from the crowd because I was screaming so <laughs> loud. <laughs> Is that <laughs> right? <laughs> Is that kind of yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. You, yeah, you where were like you, this. Roy? You went, you went like this. I was screaming <laughs> so loud. Memo, I guess. You, you went shh like a. Wait, so <laughs> what year was this? Uh, that was 2010 uh high yeah. voltage wow yeah. that's pretty that was cool. that was a whirlwind weekend for me i played with uh i started the week with dream theater on tour with iron maiden then i flew to rehearsals with avenge sevenfold then flew to england to play with transatlantic and then flew straight to montreal to play with avenge sevenfold live so that weekend was i don't even wow. remember it it was wow. just a whirlwind that's awesome that's and crazy. it was the final whirlwind to put no at the intended. time as well yeah no pun intended yeah uh let's see so you you went last all right okay nick your third one uh okay so so mike mentioned violin and jean luc ponty who in my opinion you know he and zappa made an amazing uh connection and something unique speaking of violin there's another band that used violin a lot in the, in in their recordings generally and now i'm going very he heavy prog um, as andy edwards uh one of my favorite drummers uh once uh, describe this uh, this band it's prog times 10 or it's it or, or it's prog uh, uh to an exponential level and of course i'm talking about gentle giant and their 1973 album in a glass house um now it takes a lot of listening folks it's not something that's going to come to you easily it takes a lot of dedication effort and conviction to get into this music okay but this is the prog report after all nick, nick got and... a lot of albums he's putting us to work you know like yeah yeah <laughs> I, dude i've been working hard this week <laughs> really i want you to know that so i, I mean, it's a very deep album weirdly this band seems not to do epics at all. It's mostly shorter songs, nothing longer than seven minutes, I think, eight minutes the outside. Um, it's kind of, it, it's based on the, on the predication, or I suppose you'd call it a, a, a saying or an aphorism. Uh, those in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. And those are the kind of themes that they explore in these various songs. 
Um, it, it, it's very hard work, but it's very rewarding when you get into it. This is the first album that the band did without Phil Shulman, one of the three brothers. Um, and uh, it turned out to be one of their most popular albums uh, in terms of sales. But weirdly, there's a bit of a music business story to this because they were actually dropped by their label. Um, and the band themselves were not happy because Phil Chilman had just departed and they had to deliver this album. Uh, and eventually the label dropped them and it was only available in the US as an import and a very highly priced one, apparently, until about, I think, 2004, 2005. The band thought it was too commercial. The label thought it was not commercial enough. And eventually they got dropped and then the band got the rights back and they released it on their own label. Um, also, strangely, it's got a it's got a hidden track on it, which is a kind of a synopsis of the whole album. It's a kind it, 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 it's little snippets of each of the songs made into a sort of paragraph ending as as the last song. Um, it's heavy work. Uh, if you want to use the drummer's surname, it, 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 it's, it's a weathering listen. Uh, John Weathers is the, the great drummer of, of Gentle Giant. But I promise you, if you put enough work into it, this one will reward you. Cool, man. Nice. Always good to have those guys on a list. Uh, Jeff, your next one. Okay, second all instrumental album of the of the pick. Uh, Rick Wakeman, Six mm. Wives of Henry VIII. Um, so... I'm sure most people probably know the history. Uh, Rick um, joined Yes in 1972, but had hanging over from his days in Straub's uh, a contract for a solo album uh, with AM. And um, that actually meant that's part of the reason why on Fragile, his solo piece isn't something that he wrote himself, but it's a Brahms cover version because AM. Uh, wouldn't let him use the track that they wanted to use on it, which became um, the first track on Six Wives, which is Catherine of Aragon. And it's got um, it's got Chris Squire and Steve Howe playing on it as well. Um, but again, on tour, he was reading heavy history books about Henry VIII. And, um, you know, part of... I suppose being a someone who doesn't really do lyrics, doesn't really sing, um, he wanted a a concept to hang the album on, and so he chose the stories to write music around the stories of of Henry VIII's uh, multiple wives, and um, you know, there's such a variety of music on this album, um, you know, from kind of classical church organ to you know poppy, rocky stuff, jazz elements, a whole variety of keyboard instruments. It's just a it's just a tour de force of of, of that kind of thing. And certainly one of his um defining albums, um, probably famous and familiar to yes fans because it sort of formed the basis of his keyboard solos a lot of the time, all of the elements from that. Um and and the story is that he brought it to the record company. He said it's fantastic, and you know we can't wait to hear it when the vocals go on. And he said no, there's no vocals going on it. Um, <laughs> that's what it. That's what it is. Um, again, I think I think I'm right in saying it's the first recorded, uh, sort of the first recording that Alan White played on since since um joining Yes as well as well. Um, but it's a it's a fantastic album, and in less than three weeks today i'm going to be seeing him playing it at the london palladium because he's doing a he's doing two nights at the london palladium doing Very cool. six wives journey to the center of the earth um king arthur and a set of yes songs so um yeah, i'll be seeing he's that not gonna ice up the floor is he yeah <laughs> hope not <laughs> so nice. yeah rick wakeman six wives uh, uh, a yeah, uh, cool. a real classic definitely um okay i guess i'll uh i'll bring up a, a i mean another classic rock uh mammoth album from a, a band we don't talk too much about here but i think every prog fan is is a fan of this band and how could you not be which is led zeppelin um houses of the holy there i got is. your props here for you there you go right helping me out um 
their fifth album. I they took two years after Led Zeppelin IV uh, before putting this out. Uh, eight songs. It's only forty minutes, but I mean, it is jam packed with just hit after hit after hit after you know famous song. I mean, it's just crazy. This to me is with that with uh, Led Zeppelin two. Maybe my those are my two favorite albums by the band. I think. I mean, I just love this album. Um, the song remains the same. It's just the best opener. Just so cool. All of his Jimmy Page's guitar work on this album is just so legendary. Uh, all the riffs, all the uh, the different chords and changes. I, I mean, you can learn guitar just by listening to this album. Um, it's just incredible. The drumming. I mean, all the different styles that they brought into this thing. And I was reading about this before, and I, I didn't realize. I mean, I guess it's not too surprising, but this album got bad reviews. I I, I didn't even understand. <laughs> I didn't even understand how that's possible. <laughs> criticized because it had too many different styles on it or something. I mean, for a band like, like this to write, it, no two songs are the same on this album. It's crazy. I mean, you go from Over the Hills to The Crunch to Dancing Days to Dire Maker to North Quarter, and then The Ocean is just like one of the greatest riffs ever written. Um, it's awesome. So, I mean, uh, yeah, this is just one of the one of the best albums ever made, I think, in my opinion. Jamaica. Yeah, yeah. sorry, I said Jamaica. Yeah, I, I said wrong. <laughs> I agree. I, I I almost like I said before we started recording. I almost texted you at like one a.m. last night, Roy. To I was like, man, I, that's got to be on my <laughs> top four. I mean, on, on many days, this is my favorite Zeppelin album. My favorite Zeppelin album changes from day to day. It could be two. It could be four. It could be Physical Graffiti. But th there's many days where Houses of the Holy is my favorite, and you know. The, the rock tunes, you know, Song Remains the Same and The Crunch and Dancing Days, but then also uh, the two mellow songs, No Quarter is just so incredible. And the Rain song is just so beautiful. And yeah, what it's a perfect album. Really incredible. One of my favorite Zeppelin. I also think it was interesting for them to go from the, you know, the, the, the sequencing of it, the Rain song being the second song coming right after Song Remains the Same is sort of a weird decision. And then to continue acoustic into Over the Hills as third. Yeah. You know, it's it's the whole all about it is uh, really special. So yeah, it's cool. yeah I, I think John Paul Jones is a progger at heart. I mean, he really came to the fore on this album, didn't he? With with, with the keyboarding, no quarter, um, all the arrangements that he made. And, uh, I, I don't know anybody who, who who doesn't think that no quarter is kind of proggy. I think it hasn't. Oh yeah, to plus the live version. Is, it really. I is. mean, the the song remains the same. Was uh. Uh, the you know the live film and album was recorded from this tour and the live versions of no quarter and and uh it, you know i think it's like a 20 minute version and you know in the film it's john paul jones his uh centerpiece but yeah what an album and yeah and yeah. To album covers album no, cover shot, uh, in, yeah. shot where oh, oh i don't know I don't was know. it was it giant's causeway in northern ireland oh okay about an hour, about an hour and fifteen minutes drive from from where I'm sitting right now. Wow! So was it because of that, or because of the children on there that it got banned? Yeah, they, yeah <laughs> these children are now like you know sixty years old, right? It's a, bro right. It's a brother and sister. There's a brilliant story behind. It. There's it took them about a week to do. There's one of the uh, Aubrey Paul from Hypno Hypnosis has written a book about the stories, and there's a chapter about making that. And it took them about a week because it kept raining and. At one point, there was like a guy who was had. To, they were going to have a guy painted from head to toe in silver paint, and then he kind of got poisoned by it. And it was like all sorts of crazy things. And event, I think it's like like a brother and sister, and they just had had, had wigs. So there's only actually two kids, mm -hmm. but then they did they comped it all together from multiple photographs. Yeah, but there are a, a rainy uh, a rainy uh, week on the north coast of Ireland brought an iconic album cover. So yeah. yeah. Very cool. Awesome. Amazing. Uh, okay, Nick. Oh, All right. Mike. So... Sorry, I skipped you. Mike, Mike my bad. Mike, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, my uh, my second to last pick is a, a huge one for me. In fact, it's um, it's always been in my top five albums of all, of all time. So this is a, a real top, top favorite album of mine. And it's Elton John's Goodbye, Elbrook Road. Um double album and actually elton john's second album in 73 he put out don't shoot me i'm only the piano player early in the earlier in the year and then comes out with this double album that's crazy yeah but amazing 
I mean, I remember when I was a kid, just looking at these pictures, and I love that every song had a, a, a visual to go with it. But we talk, you talk about classic sides. You know, I always talk about like Russia's moving pictures, side one being one of the classic sides of all time. Side one of this is you don't get more classic. Funeral for a friend, love lies bleeding, candle in the wind, Benny and the Jets, and then the first song on side two is Goodbye Yellowbrook Road. So those yeah. five, you know, opening up this album, it, it's absolutely classic. Of course, Saturday Night's All Right for Fighting is on here. Uh, but I love the deep cuts. I love uh, the ballad of Danny Bailey is a favorite. Uh, the song has no title. Gray Seal. Gray Seal is awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. Harmony, I'm closing the album with Harmony. I mean, yeah. I love every song on this album. It's a classic. It's an all-time favorite, and it's in my top five of all time absolutely perfect album in my in my opinion when i when i was young and, and, and let me say one more thing and the band was incredible i mean this is the yeah, classic yeah. lineup davy yeah. johnson d murray uh nigel olson of course bernie didn't play in the band but wrote the lyrics and the vocals the stories is that uh they would record all day with elton and then davy d and nigel would stay behind in the studio after elton left and the three of them would arrange all those incredible harmonies and the three of them would record the vocals and the harmonies late at night when Elton was already gone. Yeah. I I spent hours and hours when I was younger with that record, reading every lyric. I mean, even to this day, I, I, any random dumb song from that album comes on, and I, I almost remember every every word. It's it's so uh, so up there for me. It's, it's like one of my favorite records of all time. It's, it's an amazing, amazing album. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely perfect. All right, Nick. Uh, your last one okay so leaving a biggie for the last uh how can we have a list like this without the who's quadrophenia uh again the sixth album by this band uh an epic double album now for me this this wasn't uh, a story about some mod scooter writer who took drugs for me, it had a, a a far deeper, almost kind of dystopian sort of societal feel to it. I, I it was all, it almost felt science fictiony to me in a way. I don't know. Maybe it was my age. Maybe it was the the cover pick. Probably it was the music. Um, but it's just four sides of heaven. Um, it's it, you know, it's not like Pete Townsend had hadn't written other rock, rock operas. He had. Um, he'd done two, in fact, by then, but this one was just perfection. Uh, it's, it, it is on the surface, at least, the story of this young guy uh, named Jimmy, his self, uh, his, self uh, uh, his journey of self-introspection and, and how he finds himself. And it kind of leaves the story with a question mark because you don't really know what happens to Jimmy at the end. Lots of sound effects, recordings of the sea and, and howling winds and... Uh, lots of stuff that that apparently Pete Townsend recorded himself on a mobile recorder. Um, it was positively received, but not not by everybody. Um, some people thought it, it wasn't as good as Who's Next. I, I think it's their finest moment. Um, really, it was it was turned into a movie, of course, um, and and that was also successful. I just think it's the band at their peak. When you listen to Daltrey's voice, he's really pushing himself. But man, he nails it. Uh, Townsend, of course, always a genius. And I think this is Keith Moon's tightest, most concise performance, probably his most controlled performance. I don't know if you would agree or disagree, Mike. Um, but uh, it, 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 a massive undertaking, a huge, uh, huge delivery, huge composition, massive achievement. And I don't think the Who either before or afterwards, quite reached these heights. It's a masterpiece. It absolutely has to be on this list. Yeah, I love that all four of them uh, sing on the album and they each have their centerpiece, like, you know, Keith had Bellboy. And I think there's even some of the subtitles for some of the songs. This One was Roger's theme, one was Pete's theme, one was John's theme, and one was Keith's theme. And uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think this was probably their peak in the studio uh you know after this came who by numbers and who are you uh neither of which i think captured you know 
how how big and epic this was. But yeah, great, great album. And Keith's performance is amazing on it. But apparently live, they couldn't, they just couldn't reproduce this because it was all uh, a lot of pre-recorded keyboards and tape loops. And uh, you've seen the video of Keith trying to play along the bellboy and his headphones are falling off. And so I think they never really got to present this the way they intended. I, I saw them do it on the 20th anniversary tour, you know, mm -hmm. years, you know, decades later, uh, obviously without Keith in the band, but yeah, I think this is an, an absolute epic album for for the Who. Yeah, they did a they did a fantastic version. I don't know how long, not the twentieth anniversary, but a later one, where they used like, you know, clips for um the real me. They had John and Whistle, you know, kind of they had the track and they played along with it. And Keith sang, you know, Bellboy from the screen was a, a great tribute and brilliant to see it being presented as a whole thing um with the technology that they could do that today which as you say they couldn't they couldn't manage back in the day yeah yeah amazing album some classic rock staples on there that uh that you still hear all the time mm. um, love rhino me yeah that song's amazing yeah, uh all right jeff uh your next one me last choice um the day we're recording is the sixth anniversary of the passing of john wetton i just noticed and mm. uh Lark's Tongues in Aspic by King Crimson. Another As picture a box or yeah. above. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mine's mine's just right here, actually. I think <laughs> that one there, if I'm pointing at it right. Yeah. Um yeah. wait, wait, wait. I'll take I'll take it a step further. <laughs> oh, yeah, go. Oh, yeah. 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 You win. on me. There you go. <laughs> you win. That tops them all. That yeah, so I suppose the 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 checkered history of King Crimson of the band that kind of did sort of seemed to do amazing stuff and then fall apart on quite a regular basis, um, and I suppose the the lineups that have produced, um, Islands and the preceding albums had sort of folded, um. Robert Fripp managed to talk Bill Bruford away from uh yes, um and the. John Wetton, I think, and 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 Robert Fripp were both from the same town in England, and maybe even I think they knew each other at school. And Wetton had sort of been making a name for himself as a bass player, but wanted to sing. Um, and then they brought in David Cross on the violin. So again, a a, a different you know most of the Crimson lineups to that point had had saxophone, wind instruments, and they decided to bring in the violin, and then um. Fripp had probably spent most of the year before producing various experimental um, kind of jazz albums and had come across Jimmy Moore, Jimmy Muir, sorry. Um, imagine you've got Bill Bruford in the band and the first thing you do is hire another drummer. Um, yeah. But obviously <laughs> he, um, Jimmy Muir, the, the idea was like, you're not the drummer. So, and again, I'm sure most people who know this album have seen the kind of 1970s TV footage where he's kind of playing with children's whistles and banging sheet metal and doing all this crazy stuff that, you know, opens and is throughout this album. And and he, he didn't last much, Jimmy Muir didn't last much beyond that album and some touring, but my goodness, the sound um, on the whole way through that album is just incredible um it's certainly crimson but it's a very very different kind of kind of band and those big amazing instrumental pieces and then the little the softer the slower songs the the vocal pieces really you know what what what, what more can you say about lark's tongue and, and, and i guess it was the it was the shot in the arm um that I think Crimson probably needed at that point. Um, but again, even that lineup maybe only lasted a couple of years and then they were they were gone again. But um, you know, that whole run of albums that they produced was incredible, but it but it all started with with Lark's tongues. So yeah. Amazing. I mean another another cover, another that's legendary to this day. Like I mean, you even got the tattoo and uh just all the crazy stuff. Is that your favorite? Would you say your favorite Crimson album, Mike? No, actually not. Um, not even top three, beyond, uh, be, to be honest. I mean, I got the tattoo just okay. because it represents Crimson as a, a, such an iconic symbol. But I mean, my top three Crimsons would probably be in the Court of Crimson King. Red, of course, probably is my favorite. And uh, Discipline as well to get the 80s yeah. 
uh, lineup in there as well. But yeah, I mean, of course, this album is just Prague, legendary Prague album. Did, I did get to cover part two, uh, Lock's Tongue part two with Dream Theater, uh, which was which was so much fun to finally do. Yeah, yeah. bring them. Uh, all right, for my last one, um, easy pick. I mean, it's. Uh, I already like, have the record ready. I know where you're yeah, going. Yeah, uh, well, we'll, <laughs> we'll go. Be, man. The the uh, fifth album by uh, by Genesis, Selling England by the Pound. Um, I mean, I th- we, I don't know what album we've talked about more by Genesis on this pod on this podcast. Maybe this one or or Foxtrot. But um, you know, again, you're looking at another album that is eight songs only. Um, uh, highlighted by, I think, two of the all-time prog epics that any any progger goes to, which is Firth of Fifth, and which may be one of the all-time prog songs, and then Cinema Show. But you're looking at Dancing with the Moonlit Night, and uh, their first sort of hit, I Know What I Like, uh, is on there, Battle of Epping Forest, which is, you know, the longest song at 11 minutes and and uh, sort of a weird, trippy song. Um you have Phil Collins singing for the first time. Well, is this the first time? No, uh, but, yes. but lead, uh, more lead, fool yeah. me and and uh, just uh, an an amazing record uh, all around. So Steve Hackett's guitar work on this is is just some of my favorite stuff. You know, I always think about when he left, how that the the cinema show stuff and the Dancing with the Moonlight that that just left the band with him to never never be the same. But um, I love this album whether it's my favorite, my second favorite, my third favorite, it's always hard to pick for me, but I mean, some of the songs in here, it's just ridiculous. And cinema show is in my top two or three Genesis songs for me. Good classic. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right. Well, uh, you kind of, you got to know where this is going. When we did this last year for seven, 72, you knew that yeah. it was close to, to the end. This for last, so, yeah. When you do 73, there could only be one. I mean, it doesn't get bigger, and more classic than this. I mean, this is, uh, you know, obviously one of the, the greatest albums of all time. This is, you know, up there with Sgt. Pepper. And, and you know, in 73, this was a groundbreaking uh, sonic experience. You know, Pink Floyd had been building to this. You know, you felt it coming with, with uh, metal. And, you know, the track echoes in one of these days. But when this came out, you know, no album had sounded like this. This was just breaking all the ground. This was taking like the next step beyond what the Beatles did with Sgt. Pepper. And, uh, you know, the statistics on this are incredible. I don't have them in front of me, but in terms of albums sold, in terms of, uh, you know, weeks on the on the Billboard charts, I mean, it literally broke every record there was. And uh you know, uh, engineered by Alan Parsons, and yeah. and it was just uh, I mean, what, what can I say that hasn't been said a zillion times? <laughs> you know, yeah. 1973. This is this is it, and it, that's uh, a few that's albums a, have topped it since. That's a pristine looking version. Is that uh, this is I mean, one of the new reissues? Yeah. This is one of those albums I have in every format. You know, <laughs> right. from eight track to to DVD, but uh, I mean to CD and. Uh, but this is one of the the new reissues. I also have the uh, the immersion box set, and then they're also putting out a fiftieth anniversary box set uh, in a, in a few months as well. Although I I don't I'm not sure what's on that that I don't already have from the immersion set. I think I'll, I'll be able to get the vinyl of the live version. Uh, Jeff, maybe you know the details better than I no, do. No, I think I think I don't think there's anything new on it apart from yeah, as you say, the the live on um, on on vinyl. getting that on vinyl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, what, what, what I mean, can you say? Yeah, it's it's just one of those albums that I I love every song on it. I don't want to listen to many of them. I think Stephen Wilson always talks about that. You know, I don't ever want to hear Money again. <laughs> but, <laughs> but but I mean, it's just brilliant um, uh, every which way. Time Time might be the one that still sort of stands out for me. That I, yeah, that I still really well, and the, the 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 end too. Uh, you know. Uh, Brain, brain damage, damage eclipse, which is yeah. so great. I mean, as you guys know, I I did cover this whole album with with Dream Theater back in two thousand three. I think I don't remember offhand, but we we put out a live version of us performing this live at um I think it was the Hammersmith Apollo, yeah, in London, mm-hmm. and uh, it was so much fun to do it. Uh, you know, at the time, I was choosing the albums for Dream Theater to do at that point, and um, 
it's not my favorite Floyd album. I mean, The Wall is actually my favorite Floyd album, to be honest. But uh, this is the quintessential classic Floyd album. Yeah, I was actually watching that that Dream Theater video just the other night, as it happens. Um, uh, and I, I got to tell you, this is not my favorite Pink Floyd album either. Wish You Were Here is my favorite. Um, but I got to say, you guys delivering that at the Hammersmith Apollo took it to a whole new level for me, Mike. I got a kudos. Uh, thank kudos. you. It was yeah, it was, a, it was a great one to do. It was so much fun to perform it live. So what I did I didn't I only realized I didn't deliberately put my Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon bag. <laughs> I just was tidying my room at the Very weekend and hung it up yeah. here, but I see it's right beside my head as, as if I'd prepared it, but I but I, I definitely didn't. And the the other thing, the again, another album where the cover is absolutely instantly recognizable without any words on it. Everybody knows what it is. And I just figured out we had Houses of the Holy, we had Dark Side of the Moon and Band on the Run. Are all, are all hypnosis um, albums? I was going to wonder that, how many we, we had. I hadn't looked at that. Yeah. Yeah, I think there, it's just those there's three. a bit of controversy about that latest uh, uh, release that uh, that latest album cover of uh, the of reissue, Darkside. the uh, the yeah, the reissue. reissue. Yeah, Where they did the, prop, the proper that. prism. It's not. <laughs> I'm keeping <laughs> quiet about this. Yeah. 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 Well, maybe that's a different conversation uh well cool i mean i guess i i hope i, I don't know what's uh, out in 74 i haven't looked but I, well there... i have can i i have a a, a couple of honor, honorable mentions here yeah, that yeah, need yeah. to get mentioned yeah uh, there's, a, there's quite a few we left off actually. i mean what i, I did that series uh, last year the mp year in rock or whatever uh, year it was a year in music and mm -hmm. when i got to 73 it was just it was almost laughable what a year this was and, yeah. and my list ended up having to be expanded just for this year but i mean just to give you some perspective goodbye yellow brick road selling england by the pound and quadrophenia were released within two weeks of each other <laughs> can you imagine okay yeah. well, you so know cool. these are new albums from the who and genesis and elton john and just getting hit with that those three albums within two weeks so cool but three albums that haven't been na named yet uh three iconic live albums right yes songs yeah deep purples made in japan which dream theater yeah. also covered as well as uh, Genesis Live. Genesis Live, I was going to yeah, mention that. So yeah. three incredible live albums from, you know, these were iconic. I mean, the Made in Japan, uh, which Dream Theater also covered, was was just such an amazing example of like purple and the, the, their ability to improv and jam and, you know, the 20 minute version of Space Trucking. And then uh, Yes Songs, to me, this was kind of my, my go-to album for those classic Yes albums because... For me, the Holy Trinity is the Yes album, Fragile and Close to the Edge. And when you listen to Yes songs, you're getting pretty much all the tunes from those three albums, as well as uh, Six Wives of, of uh, Henry VIII as well. But uh, the only thing was this was, of course, Alan White on drums. Uh, there was a couple of Bruford tracks, but the main uh, stuff here is Alan White. And then Genesis Live. I mean, this was the quintessential live genesis uh album you know for for that period of of, of all the the, yeah. the classic gabriel stuff I, yeah. i'd also like to say that 73 was a great album not uh, a great year not just for for prog albums but for general rock albums i mean sabbath bloody sabbath grand funk we're an american band one of my favorite albums golden earrings moon tan i really mm. love that album um uh, billion dollar babies by alice cooper there's one that that one really, I, I mean, it kind of dominated the year for me. Aladdin, Honestly, Chicago, Sane, Chicago Aladdin Six, Sane, Aladdin Sane, Sane, Blue Oyster Cult, Tourney and Mutation, yeah. uh, ZZ Top, Tres Hombres, Ryan, Dan, Sweet, Count Down Dex, goes on. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, it was just it such was an soup. incredible year. Here in America, it was the first album for Aerosmith and the first album for Leonard Skinner as well. Wow. And uh, El, uh, uh, Billy Joel's Piano Man in America was a big one as, at the time as well. Yeah. I mean, it's just, the list is crazy. Beck Bogart and a piece. Wasn't Springsteen's yeah. first album that year too? Springsteen's first album on the Eagles' Desperado as well. Yeah. I mean, Amazing. it's just stupid. Like music, uh, <laughs> music could have stopped in 73. Oh, and, uh, and... I could, there's a if anybody's interested there's a really good book I, i'll i have no vested interest in plugging it but a really good book 1973 which has probably about another 10 albums that we didn't even talk about probably from bands like green slade and gong uh, and you have Ga gong a caravan camel and I think caravan a bunch, PFM. a bunch of them had albums out too pfm had oh pfm album. right 
Yeah, it, it was a really crazy year. I mean, we talked about probably the more famous, notable ones, I think. But I mean, it's it's pretty stellar. Amazing. So, uh, well, that was fun, man. Uh, cool. Maybe we could do it again next year, Mike. Uh, see what's going on. <laughs> And we'll, we'll, you know, uh, good luck on the tour. Uh, I, I'll see you on one of the shows coming up soon. So hopefully we, that'll uh, that'll be something we could do. And come to Europe. It. Come to Europe. Uh, we are. We got, uh, we got, we got three shows in the UK already booked for June. Oh, you do? And, oh I yeah. totally missed that. Yeah, we got uh, three in oh. the UK um, and a few other throughout Europe in, in June doing some festivals. And then there'll be a more extended uh, European UK run later in the year. Uh more date, more dates coming soon. Yeah, year of cool. the dog. Awesome. Yeah, congrats <laughs> on the record, man. It's killer, and happy to have the band back. And uh, we got that. Hopefully, tour. it'll make somebody's list in in uh, 20, <laughs> 20, seventy <laughs> three. Right? right now, two thousand seventy three. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll tell my kid. I'll tell my kids. <laughs> Grandkids. <laughs> uh, thinking about it from that perspective is really weird, isn't it? That's insane. Yeah so fun yeah. Yeah. All, right. all right guys have a great night we'll see y'all again soon thanks happy turn mike bye everybody bye. Thank you guys. Mike. see you soon